So let me introduce Oliver. Uh, Oliver He is Associate Professor in the Unit for Laboratory Animal Medicine, as well as in Microbiology and Immunology. Oliver's research focuses on the uh, development of ontology for vaccines, for host microbe interactions, and for the analysis of drug and vaccine adverse events. So his presentation today is uh, titled The Extensible Ontology Development, XOD, Principles and Tool Implementation to Support Ontology Interoperability and Data Reproducibility. So basically this is about when there are a number of ontologies developed in a certain field when people create metadata and when they share data tools and um, results, how they, how to standardize basically the language, the vocabulary and the language structure. So the judges especially liked Oliver's work because the team aims to ease barriers so that more people are willing to put in the effort to make their ontologies more interoperable. All right, so Oliver, I'll let you share your screen and take away. Uh, thank you, thank you, Jing, for your um, uh, introduction. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Not yet, okay. Um, okay. Yeah, you're good, you're good. You can see now, right? Yes. Okay, so let me make it larger. Yeah, first of all, thank you, uh, Jing, and uh, Midas uh, giving me the opportunity to present uh, my work. Yeah, so again, yeah, my work is about the ontology interoperability and uh, uh, using it to support uh, data reproductivity. So I'm going to give some, uh, first give some basic background. Uh, I want to quote uh, Snyder Brenner's uh, uh, saying first, we are drowning in a sea of data and thirsting for knowledge. Uh, basically, the knowledge is a special kind of data which uh, embodies uh, awareness and understanding. And now if we look for the data, you know, now we are in the area of bigger data, and the data basically has high volume and uh, it's heterogeneous. And uh, uh, it's generated uh, in a uh, in a very fast, uh, in a very fast uh, speed, and the uh, data uncertainty is also an issue. So definitely, we are facing a bigger challenge. So how can we really go from data to knowledge? Uh, how the work can be reproducible, and how can we now face the challenge? Okay, so I want to see. Uh, Ontology is uh, a foundation of AI. So let's come with a question first. So let's uh, have an AI question. So if I'm telling a robot, say I'm a human, and then I got a uh, COVID-19, right? Can you give me any medication? Then the AI, the robot would say, oh, what, what do you think, right? Or maybe the AI is much, is much smarter than what do you think. So for the AI to be smart, they should know what? They should know the meaning the meaning of the words, individual words. And then you put the words together, they should know what do you mean, right? And then they, they can rely on some background knowledge, they can give you an answer. So here we come to the ontology. So uh, ontology belongs to a, an AI scope. So they, in AI, there's a, a, a domain called uh, KR and R or KR square. So it's a knowledge representation and the reasoning. So uh, ontology is a major part and it plays more and more, and more important role. So uh, ontology basically is uh, there for more than 2000 years and uh, in the ancient like uh, Greek uh, uh, philosophers, they think ontology is uh, like uh, studying the being, reality, like uh, who we are, where we come from, right? And in the IT uh, area, we now put the computer interpretability uh, as a domain, as a major uh, criteria to classify ontology. So, so ontology relations, who we are, should be understood not only by humans, but also by computers. So that is uh, a huge task, right? So let's say if we have some ontology like this, right? Like let's say come to the same robot question, 
So we say, okay, so COVID-19 induced by the virus uh, SARS-CoV-2 and then you know, occurs in human. The human is a mammal and then this is a virus. And then we are, we are in humans and you can see, okay, in some organs like the lung, right? And then the treatment can be the remdesivir and the, which is a drug. So we, if the computer know the structure, right? Then what they will do? They are going to become smarter and they can be probably more appropriate to answer the questions we have earlier, right? They can answer the question better now. So uh, the difference between uh, taxonomy and ontology can be like a, a traditionally, tra uh, taxonomy is about the is a uh, association, right? Ontology can give more relations than is uh, So they are more kind of uh, smarter. They are, they are more inter intelligent. So this one also show how the stories about among different uh, semantic methods and uh, time and the money, right? So taxonomy is here, and then we have the thesaurus dictionary, and XML, like uh, the Jay gave a talk about uh, metadata XML. So those things are all within the scope, but definitely the higher level would be ontology and R. Also, they are more advanced. Uh, we may meet uh, the time and the money issue. Then the question becomes, how can we develop strategies and tools to reduce the time and money to keep the advantages of ontology and make it more useful to the next level. So I will tell a story about the Tower of uh, Babel. So basically, that's a, a Bible story, right? So it explains why the world's people speak different languages because God doesn't want people build up the tower. But anyway, um, we do want to build up uh, an ontology so that can be understood by uh, not only people, but in this case, more importantly, by AI, by computers. So the ontology basically is the terms uh, plus relations. The relations we call the semantic relation. So if we're looking for a uh, team, Bernie Lee, right, the inventor of the internet, uh, he will say, okay, the semantic web uh, is a form, it's an extended form of web, right? So the information is uh, given well-defined meaning and the ontology is a key to the well-defined meaning. So it's, an, it's the next level of AI. Uh, currently, we have hundreds of ontologies, if I don't say thousands. Uh, good quality, yeah, we have more than 100 uh, ontologies available, like a gene ontology, which was published uh, 2000 and now has been cited uh, more than 50,000 times in terms of uh, peer-reviewed journal articles. And then HPO, Human Phenotype Ontology, it has been cited uh, hundreds of thousands of times. And then uh, BAFO is a, a basic formal ontology. And now uh, it's top level uh, ontology. It's not actually approved by ISO as a, a global standard. So uh, now we have tons of ontologies. We have to make sure all the ontologies don't become their own silos, right? We have to integrate them together to make sure they work together. So give one example, it's like if, let's say, uh, we want to build up, uh, like the Boeing want to build up an airplane, you can buy pieces from different parts, right? Different uh, factories. But in the end, to build a, uh, an airplane, you have to put all the pieces together. So if you want to build a new ontology, you know, basically it's more like building a, an airplane. You don't want to start from scratch, right? You want to see, you want to go from different ontologies, get pieces, and then you assemble them together, make sure the airplane can fly. So I'm going to give you many examples later. So uh, basically uh, in the field of data, we have a data in a fairness, right? Data fairness means the data should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reduce, uh, re reusable. So the major thing I think is the interoperability. So if all data are interoperable, then they are easily to be findable, right? Accessible and reusable. So I feel the interoperable is a key. And then ontologies actually uh, can define the data, right? So it builds up spaces, how the data should be structured, should be annotated, should be unified. And then the ontology should be also interoperable. So interoperable ontologies are key to the data fairness. So I'm going to give 
uh, some examples, and then I'm going to show why we need an XOD. So XOD means extensible ontology development. We need uh, these uh, kind of principles to support the ontology interoperability and eventually leading to data fairness. Uh, there are four principles uh, we uh, put together. Initially we, initially, we put six, and then uh, like the viewers gave us some comments, and we reduced it to four. So we have ontology term reuse, ontology semantic alignment, and then ontology design patterns for long-term generation and editing, and then community effort. So uh, this, the first two is more like a reuse existing uh, ontology terms. This one is more for new terms. The three one, number three is for new term. So I'm going to give some examples to show why those things are important. So let's come to uh, this example. Like this is the COVID-19 example. So if you want to build a, a small ontology like this, you know, you don't have to start from scratch. And the reason is if you start from scratch, people don't understand you. But however, actually, there are ontology you can reuse, right? There are something called the NCBI, taxonomy ontology. You can reuse them, you can get all the taxonomy IDs there. And so I'm going to give you more uh, reason why you want to do it. You, you do have many benefits of doing it. And then you can look for disease, right? Disease ontology, anatomy ontology, and drug ontology. Because uh, all the other ontologies define those terms very well, and they may even give you some relations there. If they don't give relations, you build up yourself. This is why you can kind of do shopping, uh, and then you can put them together, right? Like you build up an airplane. So I uh, just want to give some examples how it actually helps our COVID-19 research. So uh, we look at all the um, uh, like uh, SARS-CoV-2, right, and, and the MERS and, uh, and the other uh, human coronavirus. And then we build up a relation, right? We use our ontology reuse strategy. And then we can quickly come up to this one. So you can see, oh yeah, they are indeed related, like uh, SARS, SARS-2 are together. You have MERS and they all belong to the beta coronavirus. And then you have alpha, you have other viruses. And then if you look for the host, right, you can, we looked at more than 20 uh, hosts, they are infected, they can be infected by coronavirus. So you can see after you group them together, they all classified under the mammal structure, more specifically classified under burial usual structure, right? So you will see, oh wow, based on the previous records, you can see most likely only mammals can be infected. And now there are rumors like right? the, the salmon, like in Beijing, salmon, oh, maybe the virus can infect salmon. But according to our record of collection, right, maybe likely not because uh, based on our previous uh, uh, kind of uh, collection, and at least it's a hypothesis, right? So we are actually testing the hypothesis. How, why uh, only mammals are likely uh, interacting with uh, or infected by the coronavirus? Uh, so basically, we're just looking for the data and reuse and reanalyze the information. You can get a lot of outcome. So it's not only like literal those terms, but also the background. Another example is like uh, now if you're looking for the drugs, right? You have a, a lot of more than 100 drugs. So if you put them together, it's more like a, a table. It's uh, like a Excel table or a table in paper, but you cannot go that far, right? You probably manually put some sense there. But if you put them into ontology structure quickly, you can find a lot of good ideas. You can find uh, some uh, drugs that you can classify it under some structure. They can have rows, and then you can do some query, right? Say, oh, tell me all the drugs they have a row of anti-malaria, and it gives you a list of uh, drugs, right? So it's again, looking for all the background, all the information, reproducible information, and then put them together. So here I told to you about uh, how ontology reuse and, uh, and alignment can be important, right? So we are also now developing some ontology, we call it a CIDO. So it's a coronavirus infectious disease ontology. So this one we started in the end of January, but actually it's getting very famous now. A lot of people are, are, are joining us and, uh, and, and uh, working with us. And uh, the previous example 
that kind of some screenshots of our work. And we also just publish paper in scientific data. It's a nature branch journal. Uh, it's a common paper, um, but uh, to illustrate uh, how the work can be potentially useful. But again, we are basically using the, the reuse and alignment strategy and uh, using the community-based uh, uh, strategy. And then if we find any current state that exist in existing ontology, right? We change our own. But when you change your own terms, you know, you want to use something called ontology design patterns because we can find some patterns you can put them in. So that is more like uh, some basic idea of how to develop XOD and apply XOD for ontology development. And we use some uh, kind of pipeline, you know, you can use uh, like uh, reuse by reuse turns and align them, and then you can add a new turns if uh, the turns you cannot find from other resources. We also develop tools like, uh, yeah, our one lab develop something called own animal tools, like on the forest, on the, yeah, they, they are used based on different uh, uh, criteria, you know? So something look like uh, easy, but uh, often you feel like uh, it can be difficult, you know, if you want to do just copy paste, it takes a lot of time. But if you use our tools, it can be easy. So these are tools, our tools, actually they are quite easy. If you know background about ontology, you can easily you know, catch up and use it. But there are also some tools you don't need a web, you know, like uh, this is a web tools, like a robot is command line tools, Java, you can easily use it yeah, if you want. So I just want to give one example due to the time limitation. Just want to give one example how the tools can be used. So this uh, A is more like a website. So let's say if we want to get a human mouse and rat, let's assume they are all important for, for coronavirus study, right? The human is infected with uh, the virus and the mouse and red, they can be used as uh, animal models. So you, know, you want to get these things into your ontology, how do you want to do it, right? Actually, we are customized for users to have different options, right? You can have, okay, I have the three species all under eukaryota, so all eukaryotic organisms. Or you want to see, I do want to find some relations among them, like the rat and the mouse, they are belonging to the mirroring like genus, right? And with the humans, they all belong to higher level. Or you want to say, oh, I don't want the, not only this, I want all the hierarchies. So you, you can go many, many, right? Like uh, uh, a lot of, uh, a uh, lot of hierarchies here, so it can be 30, 40 hierarchies. Depending on different people's needs, you can get different stories. But again, you get a lot. You just look for the web interface. It's very simple. You just give three lines, and then you tell some basic uh, ideas, how you want to do it, we give you the results. So it's very easy to use. Uh, so yeah, I will not talk about other tools. That one just give you a flavor how the tools can be useful. And then why we say it's a community effort because indeed uh, before there were hundreds of ontologies then they don't have some kind of co-organization, a lot of conflicts and uh, non-interoperability uh, issues. So then there were um, uh, organization, you know, it's a user just a, developing the organization by themselves, and I'm a part of it. I'm happy to be part of it. It's called the Oval Foundry. It's open biomedical and the biological ontology foundry. So, and we applied, you know, for CIDO, the coronavirus infectious disease ontology, and luckily they approved our application. So CIDO is one Oval ontology. And we also have a basic formal ontology, as I mentioned, it's now just last month approved to be an ISO top level ontology. So fortunately, most of over ontologies aligned with the top level. So now we have a unified uh, way to, to work together. And then it goes beyond the biomedical and now we have industrial ontology foundry, IFO. So yeah, it's, it's a lot of work going on, but the people realize, yeah, it should be community effort. And then I will give another example. It's about uh, uh, precision medicine. So in biomedical data, we have uh, clinical finding, we have basic studies, and uh, often we don't collaborate together. So we don't know 
how the mechanisms and how we develop drugs or vaccines, because it's hard to put the data together. So indeed, ontology actually is quite helpful. So it can integrate all the things together, right? And there is a, a good paper uh, just published about uh, uh, two years ago. Uh, it's in the New England Journal of Medicine. So it's a very top level journal and the people really are recognizing uh, ontology can play a good important role. And then we have a funding uh, called the KPMP, it's a kidney precision medicine project. It's funded by the NIH, more than 20 institutes are coming together. So we want to build up a kidney tissue atlas, which will link the phenotypes, cell molecules, parts with patients all together to make sure we can better understand human diseases, including the acute and the chronic kidney diseases, and then trying to develop methods to control those diseases. So we just have a paper uh, just accepted by Nature Review Nephrology. We introduce our framework and how ontologies can support the KPMP project. But uh, in our story, we basically focus on developing two ontologies. One is KTA, is a kidney tissue atlas ontology, one is OPMI, focusing on precision medicine in general. Yeah, well, this is probably giving the matter of time uh, let me just check the time quickly. Uh, yeah, basically you want to link all the things together. And then it basically uh, put a pathology molecule and clinical together. Well, this one I want to see, you now we can basically use our strategy to model one simple example, but then as you know, once you model a simple example, you have all the background together linked to you, and then you can use the same idea to model more and more examples. And uh, here is another one, it's the clinical, the current method, and the ontology method, and now our precision method link the clinical molecular pathology all together. And also I want to say uh, our XOD go beyond biomedical. So like currently we are working with uh, Robert Hemshire and uh, many people, and now developing a project called the Transportation System Ontology. It's really supporting transportation, like a Uber, they like to join us, right? And this TSO also use buffer and use our uh, XOD strategies. And uh, yeah, don't have time, but definitely many usages, including metadata, like a Stanford, uh, Mark Musen's lab developed a tool called CETA. CETA is an ontology-based metadata uh, tool, so it can definitely support uh, metadata analysis. So definitely ontology can be very useful and also support the metadata uh, applications. So here I want to say, yeah, we are a community effort. We are developing a lot of things as a community, not only uh, Obo Foundry, but also we have many users in Michigan. And uh, we, we welcome uh, everyone to pay attention to the ontology and how interoperability can be important and we can work together as a team and we have tools to support the effort. That's it, uh, thank you. All right, thank you both, uh, and, and Oliver. Um, let's see, I don't see any question from the audience for now. And given the interest of time, we really are at three o'clock. Let me, let me just ask one question one, um, to, to both of you. So, and that is there, this kind of effort of building standards and trying to promote uh, uh, standardized practices and, and providing guidelines are really very critical. But in reality, uh, for individual research teams, there are a lot of barriers for them to adopt um, such standards and guidelines. In addition to you know, a lack of awareness, there's also, there are also issues about how much effort they need to put in, um, you know, whether it's easy for them to learn how to use this and whether, you know, it, whether they can see the benefit. So my question for, to both of you is, um, well, actually it's a couple of uh, questions. One is how do you help the team uh, or handhold them, right? So they can actually uh, 
make it so so so, to, so make it as easy as possible for, for them to adopt your tools, right? And second mm -hmm. is how do you demonstrate uh, the benefits to their research by using the guidelines and, and the standards? Ultimately, though, whose responsibility should <laughs> is it, right, to promote these guidelines, right? It shouldn't be individuals who actually develop these guidelines. It might be some, you know, larger entities. So, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I can, uh, yeah, I, I can answer first, and then maybe Jay can can add your uh, your case. So, uh, for ontology development, actually. Yeah, we don't have yet. Yeah, first of all, it's community effort. But second of all, you don't have to think, oh, it's just uh, too, too much for me. But uh, I remember like uh, more than 10 years ago, like 13 years ago, I went to Cold Spring Harbor and uh, the gene ontology, so many, it's most famous ontology and the developer, uh, Michael from the Cam Cambridge University. And he gave us 10 methods to develop good ontology. And then he said, uh, the first one is build up from a small team, actually. You don't, have, you don't want to have a team more than 10 people. A few people is enough, because if you have more people, it's so difficult to, to get an agree, agreement, right? So just small team, develop ontology, and then you give some samples demonstration, and then eventually you bring up the whole community. You do want to make sure your, your work is, uh, is getting to the level of community level. So you want to see if there are any existing ontologies there. If there are, you're trying to reuse them. If there is none, right? You generate your own. But you generate your own, you're trying to reuse others and then focus your own, your, your own demand. Uh, so it's definitely uh, doable for all people. And often, it's hard for people to have all the technologies. Then you go to some simple tools, like uh, our tools. Then it's very simple. You don't even need to have a, a programming skill. You can start from there. So yeah, let's talk here. All right. We're already um, a few minutes past. So um, I'm not seeing any questions from the audience. So I would say let's just end here. Thank you very much both of you for the wonderful presentation and the wonderful work.